Peter King from uh, the Monday Morning Quarterback, uh, Sports Illustrated, uh, Football Night America, joining us in the man cave. Yeah, just from the age standpoint, you know, Tiger's an old 37 with those knees, but um, I'd probably take him instead of Phil. And it, you know what? The way the golfers are now, a lot of, you know, they keep themselves in better shape and the technology is so much better. He's the kind of guy I keep thinking to myself when I watch him. He's the kind of guy who's going to say this is not acceptable and he's going to kill himself to try to get back to where he was. Now, Willie, I don't know, but that's a very interesting question. I would take Tiger. Who wins uh, a championship sooner, Tiger or Tony Romo? Tiger. Okay. <laughs> Come on. I mean, and I, I don't, it's not that I don't think Romo, you mean a major championship? Yes, a major championship. So that would mean that Romo would have to win the Super Bowl yes. this year because you would think that in the next that next year that Tiger would win one of those four, wouldn't you? Or do you not think that anymore? I don't think it's a foregone conclusion, yeah, but yeah. I, I would lean towards Tiger, yeah. you know, to, to win. Uh, I mean, the Cowboys have uh, been eight and eight the last two years. I know. You know, I was out there over the weekend and I walked away thinking, I can't believe this team's going to be eight and eight. I think they're better than that. I think they run better. I think they're going to be better on defense. I don't know about Monty Kiffin, but I think they got good corners to play in this modern era of football. I think they're better than eight and eight, but who knows? There's a lot of teams that think they're better. But don't than eight we eight. always do this? We yeah. do this with the Yankees, where we go, "Oh yeah, I mean they're going. They could. Well, they you didn't could do that this year with the Yankees, did you? No. Well, no, no because of all the injuries going in. But right. this is a rare year. This is a rebuilding year for the Yankees. But yeah. the Cowboys seem like they've been in rebuilding mode, even though they shouldn't be with the talent that they have on the field. I mean, they should not be eight and eight. No, they shouldn't be. But there's remember, there's 32 teams. And in that division, what's happened in the last four years in the NFC East? Four different teams have won the division. With the exception of the Washington Redskins, the other three teams in the last four years are within two wins of each other. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a total crapshoot in that division. It's the most even division in football. If you're looking at quarterbacks now, uh, I know a lot of times we look at the guy who's getting paid. You know, Joe Flacco got paid. Romo got paid. But... If you're looking at where quarterbacks are now, the fact that you have the, you know, Seattle can spend money because their quarterback is not getting paid a whole lot of money. Right. Colin Kaepernick's not getting paid a whole lot of money. How does that change for these teams when Russell Wilson starts to get paid or Colin Kaepernick gets paid as far as the talent they can go out and get uh, and improve their teams? Well, the best thing for teams right now about the way the draft works and about the way the salary structure works is that great young players are not going to make real money for three years. But it's been that way. How many years is it in baseball? Isn't that four years in baseball before you can get paid? Yeah. It might even be longer than that. I don't know. But And in basketball, they have the same thing. They have a salary scale early on. The NFL just was late to the party. You know, They should have had that a long time ago, and now they finally have it. Um, but you know, when Russell Wilson ends up getting paid in Seattle in 2015, he, he'll deserve it and he'll hit, he'll break the bank if he plays like he did his rookie year. I think it's, I mean, clearly guys are going to make up for not having a great salary for three years when they're great players early. That's just the way it is. I don't know if this headline stood out with, uh, what I saw with Geno Smith, where he says, I got a chance to win this job. Now, I, I don't know if the perception, if perception and reality collide here, but if you're Rex Ryan, do you buy an extra year if you go to Geno Smith now? Because if you go with Sanchez and you don't do well, but you know Re Rex Ryan is only going to play the guy who he thinks is the best guy. I honestly don't think he's going to think about that. But I do think if it's very close, if it's marginal, I think he'll start Sanchez early with a very very short rope. I think Geno Smith is playing there by week six or seven. He's starting. Yeah. I mean, haven't you seen enough of Sanchez over the last two yes. years to not trust him? But then I also, you know, Geno Smith has got the same guys that Mark has. Right. I'm not saying he'll better. be better. Oh, I'm not okay. saying he'll be any good. Oh, okay. I'm just saying that I think, if you ask me, my gut feeling, I think Geno Smith is starting by week six or seven. What do you think will be the um, – any chance that, you know, with Philadelphia, you got Nick Foles and Michael Vick. Any chance Matt Barkley is the starter in Philadelphia this year? At some point, maybe, but I think only, I think those guys would have to lose the job. The one thing about you get the feeling about Kelly, who is, to me, and I wrote this this morning in Monday Morning Quarterback, that 
I think this is the most anticipated college going to pro, college coach going to pro football since Jimmy Johnson in 89. And I know there have been a lot of great ones, Spurrier, Saban, and all that. But the point that I, I would make is that you don't know what this guy is going to do, what Chip Kelly is going to do. He's already brought in this really weird sports science coach. we got a really good story on our new website, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point. But we got a really good story tomorrow running on this guy who's their new sports science coach who is, you know, this is like the miss. It's his CIA. This is Edward Snowden stuff. You know, they aren't telling, <laughs> they are not saying a word, you know, they about what he does, how he does it. The players are careful talking about it. the only point I'm making it and forget that. But do you really know what kind of offense you're going to see with Chip Kelly? I don't, I don't think anybody really knows. We, when we asked Tony Dunn, you remember we were sitting at dinner last year and we asked him about yeah. it, you know, wh- wh- what he does. And he said, well, it's going to be fast. He said, I think it's going to be like Ted Marchabrota, Jim Kelly, the K-Gun in Buffalo when the quarterback really had it going and there was a lot of power. And that's the one reason why I've said all along, do not necessarily hand Michael Vick the starting job. I'm, I don't know who's going to win the starting job. But Chip Kelly's the kind of guy who's not afraid – to go get didn't it wasn't the quarterback that he used at Oregon last year the number three high school quarterback in the state of Hawaii when he was recruited by Oregon so he doesn't care you know Chip Kelly doesn't even care who he plays he's going to play the guy who he likes the best I would think that Barkley has a chance because this is about the number of plays that you squeeze off you know I, I don't think it's that run and shoot I don't think it's what he did at Oregon as much as it is the the process is let's speed up our offense. I would agree because, and I think eventually Barkley's definitely going to have a chance to play there. But I'll tell you what, Dan, in my opinion, if you are Chip Kelly, you drafted Matt Barkley because he was a gift that fell out of the sky. Wouldn't you think that in the second or third round, if he really liked Matt Barkley a lot and had faith in him to be a great long-term quarterback, that they would have stolen him in the third round? I, I that's what I think. So that's why I don't necessarily think I if I'm if I'm him, you know, I think Barkley eventually is gonna play there. Eventually. I don't know when that is, two years from now, whenever, but I think it'll be one of the other guys early on. He's Peter King, his new website. We'll talk about that. Uh M M Q B VMMQB.com. Oh, MMQB.com is a furniture company or something down in North Carolina. <laughs> and I have no idea why, but it is. <laughs> we'll talk about the website and uh how it's different from what he had with Sports Illustrated. We'll uh, continue with Peter and uh, your questions, Danpatrick.com. We'll ask Peter uh, a variety of things. The Patriots situation certainly is interesting of what style of offense are they going to uh, put out on the field, and are they going to be more of a defensive-minded team? So we'll talk to Peter about a variety of things. We'll continue that half past the hour. This is the Dan Patrick Show. Uh, Peter King joining us. Uh, his website, the new website, is themmqb.com, Monday morning quarterback. What's different about this website as opposed to what you did with Sports Illustrated? I think it's going to be a little more experiential. It's going to take you places where you really haven't gone before in the NFL, in my opinion. I mean, the first day one, we've got Jason Garrett's Saturday evening training camp speech to his Dallas Cowboys. will be on up on the site uh, later today. The full speech will be up on the site later today. The, the condensed highlights is up right now in my column, Monday Morning Quarterback. And then, you know, we're doing other things. I sat in on some meetings with... Uh, the Arizona Cardinals. I'm writing about that. Most interesting thing is Bruce Arians being a hands-on teacher. It sounds like he's a sixth grade teacher harping on, you know, a sixth grade English teacher harping on grammar and the agreement of tenses on the littlest things. I just love that. I thought it was the coolest thing. So we're writing about that. But a lot of this too is going to be video oriented. We're going to have smart video content um, in connection with the site. And we're going to try to bring you places in the NFL you haven't gone before. Kyle Shanahan taught me a little bit about the read option and using it with the pistol. Um, Greg Bedard, one of our staffers, used to work for the Boston Globe, went out to Stanford to learn about how to defend the read option and wrote about that for tomorrow. So a lot of that kind of stuff. We're not going to be Florio. We're not going to be Schefter or Glazer or Mort. We just... You know, we got three new writers on our staff, uh, Bedard, Jenny Varentis, and Robert Klemko, and I really want them to examine the game a little bit more than to try to find out who's getting the next big contract. You have a 12-month-a-year tw- a sport now yeah. for the commissioner. Yep. And that used to be you had an off-season where you could sort of take a deep breath. It, the off-season is sometimes 
more headline making than what's going on during it's got, the season. It, it, the NFL has perfected. One of the reasons why that we thought about this really is they perfected the hot stove concept of football. Just look at pro football talk. Mike Florio has stuff up. He's got he's got 15 posts on June 15th when nothing is happening or July 15th. Yeah. That to me is the real challenge I think of doing of making a year-round website of, ma- of putting up something interesting on June 28th. I I think there's going to be one month where everybody says please give us a break. I know that's the way I feel at that time of year. But I think the biggest thing that we have to add to the equation is we have to give people a reason to come. There's just too much there's too much stuff out there. So we have to force people to adopt something new in their football media experience. Johnny Menzel with what happened at the Manning passing camp. I yeah, I don't know if you extrapolate that um, or you say this is habit forming or you know what, that's an aberration here. But I'm curious from an NFL perspective, anybody commenting on this kid off the field? Anybody? Yeah, I think, I mean, I talked to one personnel guy for a team that will definitely be interested in picking a quarterback next year. And he goes, you know, we're going to have to do a lot of work on this guy because there are nothing but red flags for him off the field. And, you know, don't don't get me wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong. I don't even have a problem with a 20-year-old kid having a few beers because 20-year-old kids, 18-year-old kids, 19-year-old kids in college have a few beers. My problem is telling Archie Payton and Eli Manning, I'll be there. And not only skipping out on a whole day when you've got – a group of 12 kids who you who are your campers, who you're going to work on fundamentals with, and you decide not to show up for whatever reason. I don't care what the reason. You decide not to call anybody to say I'm not going to be there. And that wasn't the only thing. He was late for other stuff. All I'm saying is if that's not a red flag, I don't know what is. And I don't care if he's out getting a tuna fish sandwich. That is a monumental red flag to me. Talent-wise, though, Russell Wilson has helped Johnny Manziel tremendously because now you've got maybe four quarterbacks this year, shorter quarterbacks this year, who could start play 16 games for pretty good teams. Andy Dalton, Michael Vick, Drew Brees, and Russell Wilson. Now, three of those four, Dalton's about 6'2", and the other ones are all under 6'1". You know, and Russell Wilson's about 5'11". I stood next to him in Seahawks camp. There's a, there's a, uh, we had a video on the MMQB.com this morning with me and Russell Wilson. I'm, I'm a half inch taller or so than Russell Wilson. I'm about six feet. But the thing is, those guys will help Rus- will help Johnny Manziel not only because of their height, but because of their size. And as long as Johnny Manziel, the one thing he has to prove to people, he doesn't have to go on the stretching machine to grow. What he has to prove to people is he's got enough arm. The throw last year that was a signature throw of the whole season was Russell Wilson's long throw downfield to Sidney Rice in double coverage to beat the Patriots. You have to make that throw in the NFL. That's a throw that Johnny Manziel this year at Texas A&M has to prove to scouts he can make. Peter King joining us in studio. VMMQB.com, his new website. Um, The Patriots, always interesting. But trying to figure out what they do offensively, because Belichick, now you bring in the tight ends, and all of a sudden you stretch the field with Hernandez and uh, and Gronk. So now Hernandez in jail. We don't know about Gronk. They do have a good running game. you got young wide receivers. Um, can you see the Patriots changing to be a defensive first type team as opposed to an offensive first? I can't see that now because I still don't think they have a pass rusher, a preeminent pass rusher on their team. I like Chandler Jones. I like Rob Ninkovich. But I don't think there's anybody you really game plan around on that defense, at least right now. Look, even though they're missing Welker, they're going to miss Gronkowski at the beginning of the season, and obviously they don't have Hernandez anymore. I think if you're the Patriots, you have to figure, you know, in Tom we trust. Because remember last year, they played and won without both Gronkowski and without Hernandez. Now, Welker's a different story, but I, I think if, and I've been hard on the, the, the pick of Amendola over Welker because he's missed 19 of the last 32 games because of injury. But if, if Amendola plays, he should be able to do what Welker did. The whole question is, Welker was durable, Amendola hasn't been. 
Amendola will be a key, and one other guy on their offense will be a key, in my opinion, a very versatile player who has not gotten to touch it a lot, who I think this year will, is Shane Vereen. I think you're going to see him play in a variety of roles for the Patriots, you know. But the one thing about Aaron Hernandez that very few people are talking about is how incredibly versatile he was. He's more versatile than any tight end in football. Well, you can line up in the backfield. Hey, he won. He didn't win, but I mean, he won a playoff game. The Patriots won a playoff game with him being the running back yeah. against the Denver Broncos. They would have won the game anyway, but he was really good as a running back. And, you know, the guy could do it all. And uh, that's what the Patriots are going to miss. Uh, how many times do you think you talked to Aaron Hernandez? I talked to him once in my life. I don't, I don't, I don't know him at all. Yeah. Because everybody, and I, I remember talking to him, but not, I wasn't on, wasn't on the air. I just talked to him casually, socially. But, you know, you don't, you're not thinking anything until you reflect back on it. And then even then, I, I didn't really know him. No. I mean, you just seem kind of nondescript. You know, I think a lot of people at the Patriots, I, I'm told that Aaron Hernandez walked out of the building and always went his own way. Yeah, you know, he just didn't hang around with those guys very much away from the facility. So, and I'm sure if there were some team bonding crapola stuff, he'd be there. But I'm saying, on a, as a general rule, he left and did other things outside the building. You know, I don't even think the Patriots knew he had some this crash pad wherever that was, this uh-huh. extra apartment to do whatever it is he did in it. I, I, you know, I don't even know that the Patriots knew he had that. So, I, I mean, this will just cause, I think, the Patriots, as well as many other teams, just to redouble their efforts to get security to know some of the nefarious things their players might be involved in. But you look at these coaches, some will take a chance. Belichick's always taking a chance. He's not afraid. Um, do you? He's one of the few, in my opinion, and Jeff Fisher is the same in St. Louis. You can criticize him all you want. He's going to do what he wants to yeah. do. And at the end of the day, if he doesn't win enough, he'll get fired. You know, but he doesn't really care about people in the outside world saying, boy, you're taking too many chances. And like, you know, look, I, I've said this all along. If I told you that Aaron Hernandez would give you three years and catch 175 balls and do the following X, Y, and Z stuff, would that be worth the 113th pick in the draft? I would say yes, 100 out of 100 times. Look at how many 113th, 118th, 109th pick in the draft don't make it into a second season in the NFL. It happens all the time. So they got enough production out of them to merit, you know, the worth of the pick. But obviously, giving it to do over again, the Patriots never would have taken him because of this this amazing scandal. Uh, the obligatory question, because Skip Bayless emailed this in. Uh, <laughs> Who's going to win the Super Bowl <laughs> no, this year? <laughs> Tim Tebow even making <laughs> Tebow even making the roster in New England. I don't think he's going to make it as a tight end. I, I really, Dan, I don't see him. I mean, I'm not saying he won't get some tight end snaps maybe at some point. So but, he makes the roster. Well, if I had to bet right now, I would say yes, he'll make the roster wow. as a as a utility player. Really, he's going to be Burt Campanaris. He's going to be a guy who can play nine positions. Cesar Tovar. Yes. I think he's going to be a wow. guy who can be... Who, who's gonna who's gonna play in a game? Because I I keep asking this question. Remember that bizarre thing he used to do at Florida? He'd be at the two yard line. He'd take a shotgun snap. He'd run to the yeah. middle, and then he'd do that jump pass yeah. to a wide open whoever in the end zone. I just, I mean, how do you plan for that? How do you plot for that if you're playing the Patriots? Let's say here's my scenario: He's inactive two weeks in a row. And they go to play the Miami Dolphins, let's say, some week. The Jets. and uh, The Jets, that's fine. <laughs> they go to play the Jets. Yeah. And then suddenly he's active against the Jets. Well, you've got no vision of him on tape. You don't know what he's going to do. That's the kind of no. thing. And then you line up at the one-yard line, you spread the field, and you tell Tebow, get it in the end zone somehow. You want to throw it to somebody? Fine. You want to barrel your 252 pounds? Run up the middle. I, that, I think that's a weapon. I think that's valuable. When do you make your Super Bowl pick? Uh, as late as possible, because right now I am clueless. Don't pick the Chargers. I'm clueless. Here. I'm not picking the Chargers. <laughs> Chargers. Uh-oh. Breaking news: There's a royal baby. Chargers have no chance of winning the Super Bowl. Uh, good luck. What about the royal baby? Did it happen? No, but it's going to happen today. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes, uh, but uh, you can do your Royals breakdown I know, later. I am bitter that the Royal Baby decided to come out the day of the MMQB.com. Wow. Well, well, we don't know I'm that bitter. yet. We don't know that yet. Well, but just the attention. It's labor. taken away 
from what is justifiably my day, Dan. Well, it could have been worse. It could have been if Kim Kardashian had her baby today. Oh, that, then I wouldn't have launched today. We would have waited <laughs> till tomorrow. It would have been Tuesday morning quarterback. VMMQB.com, Peter King's new website. Pete, great to see you. Thanks for Thank joining you, Dan. us.